thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about universal acceptance of domain names and email addresses at Nanog. Uh, I'll be providing a technical interview. Um, my name is uh, Sarmad Hussain, and I am uh, at ICANN with the IDN and UA programs. So we're all uh, familiar with the domain names. Um, and um, here is an example of a, a more traditional domain name, which we are all used to using. Um, each domain name actually consists of a series of labels. Um, so you can, uh, which are separated by dots. Uh, so for example, in this case, you can have uh, uh, www.cafe, hyphen one two three dot com uh, which contains dot well, it contains com which is normally referred to as a top level domain um, and then you have cafe one two three which is a second level domain and then www which is a third level domain name or label and so on and uh, collectively together they form uh, a completely realized domain name uh, each of these labels have uh, some specific rules uh, which they need to follow for the do for these domain names to be valid. Uh, so for um, second level and third level, for example, um, the label must be formed by letters A through Z, digits 0, 3, 9, uh, and hyphen, a combination of these three sets. And the length of a label cannot be more than 63 characters or octets. And then there can be other constraints. So for example, a label cannot start with a hyphen and so on. Um, however, uh, the top level domains are slightly more special uh, than the other uh, domain names. So for example, in RFC 1123, uh, it suggests that uh, the top level domain names should be alphabetic, which means that uh, the top level domain names are restricted to letters A through Z and of course cannot contain digits and hyphen. Um, and then of course the label length uh, of 63 still applies. So um, uh, there has been, uh, uh, you know, early on since the domain names became available, uh, communities across the globe which have been using the internet have also been sort of asking uh, uh, for the ability to have domain names in local languages. Um, and uh, the community, of course, has uh, worked um, on making standards available <clears throat> uh, for this purpose. Uh, the first standard, uh, which is normally referred to as the internationalized domain name standard, in, uh, well, IDN in applications uh, standard, uh, came out around 2003, so it's uh, referred to as IDNA 2003, which eventually matured uh, to a second revision in uh, around 2008, so it's uh, normally referred to as uh, Internationalized Domain Names and Applications uh, 2008 or IDNA 2008 standard. Uh, it is um, similar in, uh, to uh, what happens in ASCII. So this is an example of a domain name in Tibetan script. Uh, again, uh, we have labels separated by a dot. And um, however, um, to make sure that the uh, domain name can be implemented in any of the different scripts available, the encoding scheme is no longer dependent on ASCII, but actually uses uh, Unicode. Um, and a valid uh, domain name label uh, as per IDNA 2008 now is normally referred to as a U label, or I guess a short of uh, saying it's based on Unicode. Um, and uh, it is uh, basically using a similar scheme as the letter digit hyphen or a LDH scheme. Um, in, in the sense that uh, in the Unicode, it, uh, you can form labels using normally letters, marks, and numbers. Um, there are more details about what uh, the constraints on forming labels uh, within the IDNA standard, which is based on RFCs 58, 90, and through 94. 
uh, and then for top level of course uh, uh, in the Unicode format, only letters, uh, the letter principle applies, which means, of course, digits are not allowed and so on. So if um, we are really talking about uh, internationalizing the domain name system, uh, we really need to work on all the different scripts uh, and make sure that we can figure out what is the subset of uh, characters or letters or code points uh, which can be allowed in domain names. And um, as I shared, uh, there is an algor algorithmic way uh, which is uh, used uh, in the uh, IDNA 2008 standard, uh, which uses uh, character properties uh, in Unicode uh, and uh, calculates this algorithmically. In addition to just uh, calculating a short list of uh, what characters are allowed in domain names, uh, we actually have a, another uh, problem which obviously needs to be resolved. So we, uh, you know, when we um, do the more traditional domain names which are based in, on ASCII standard, uh, we are really dealing with one script which is Latin script and we're really dealing with 63 characters out of the 127 which are allowed. Uh, if we move to Unicode, the problem obviously is much bigger um, to resolve because, you know, just looking at Unicode 11 version, it uh, encoded 148 scripts um, and had 137,000, uh, more than 137,000 possible characters encoded. So the question, of course, becomes how many of these scripts and how many of these characters actually should be allowed. And not only that, but what it does is that it increases the confusability of possible domain names. Uh, we already know that there is obviously some possible confusions even in ASCII. So for example, uh, the lowercase l can be confused by the number one. Uh, but when we go from 63 letters of uh, characters to you know, uh, 137,000 characters, uh, we have uh, that particular confusability to deal with in, in a much larger scale. So I give some examples here from different scripts and the confusability can occur in many ways. So there is visual uh, confus uh, confusability. So for example, if you look at the second two uh, domain names for the first uh, set or in Arabic script, you'll see that visually they're identical, the second and the third labels, even though technically they're quite distinct uh, because one of the characters actually is it. Uh, it's actually different, uh, but it's visually identical. Uh, in Chinese, there's a different problem where uh, even though visually characters can be distinct, but they're perceived as exactly the same uh, because Chinese uses two kinds of writing systems, uh, The simplified Chinese and the traditional Chinese and the uh, users of Chinese script can actually mix these two sets of characters so they can perceive these two visually distinct uh, labels as the same. And uh, then we can actually have cross script uh, variant labels. So uh, the example of Epic here in English uh, looks identical to another string in Cyrillic script, uh, which we use to write, for example, languages like Russian even though technically the code points in Unicode are uh, all distinct. So we also have to deal with uh, these kind of uh, issues. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there are obviously mechanisms uh, which are used uh, to deal with it. Um, uh, I am going to talk a little more about uh, how we are dealing uh, in this uh, for these kind of cases uh, for top level domains. Uh, for the root zone of the internet. Uh, so what we uh, did at ICANN was, uh, uh, you know, this was a problem to solve for uh, top level domains. Uh, we want to make sure that top level domains are uh, unique, uh, not only technically, but also unique from a uh, you know, perception of uh, end users. Uh, if uh, end users consider two labels the same, uh, then, uh, of course, even though, as we saw, that technically there could be different labels, but they can cause a significant amount of confusion for the end users. And therefore, we want to, of course, uh, identify things or labels which are uh, in some ways the same. Uh, we call these uh, variant uh, labels. And uh, 
uh, or variant code points in case we're talking about uh, it at a code point level. And um, one of the things which uh, I can uh, realize earlier on when we are making these uh, rules for uh, root zone error, uh, for the root zone or top level domains was that, uh, of course, uh, the strength or understanding of each script lies with the community which uses the script. So what we've actually done uh, in uh, with the guidance of the community is we've developed uh, what are called the root zone label generation rules, which can be used to develop the top level domains and also identify any variant labels. And uh, the way it has worked is that we've actually reached out to all the different script communities. So we've uh, worked with the Chinese community, the Korean community, the Cyrillic script community, Latin community, Arabic script community, and so on. So uh, we formulated panels for each of the communities which use these scripts and uh, provided uh, them with, in a way, a guidance through a procedure uh, to develop these root zone LGRs. And the each of the community worked over multiple years to devise the quote unquote right solution uh, to develop top level domains. And uh, each community would develop a solution, hand it over to a panel, which uh, ICANN has hosted. This panel is independent uh, and consists of experts from Unicode and DNS and IDNs. And they take in the proposal from each of the script community and integrate into one set of rules. Uh, which we call the root zone LGR, which you can take a look at. Uh, there's, there's a link uh, to it uh, in, in the slide. And those rules are then used to formulate the right top level domains and also identify any variant labels. Top level domain name labels are now uh, also possible. I can actually has been working with the community to allocate or delegate both the country code level, top level domains and the generic top level domains in local languages and scripts. So for on the in the CC space or in the CCTLDs, uh, there's already 62 strings which have been evaluated successfully from 43 countries and territories. And of these 61 have already been delegated into the root zone. On the generic top level domain side as well in the 2012 round, uh, community was able to apply for strings uh, in local languages. Uh, and so far, there are 92 internationalized domain names uh, delegated as top level domains, uh, generic top level domains. Um, and you can see a complete list of these uh, in the IANA database link from here. So that uh, also brings us to a new uh, challenge, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, getting these uh, domain names and the email addresses formed using these domain names, you know, getting these universally accepted by all the different applications. Um, and um, uh, that's uh, obviously expected, but that's not true at this time. Um, so the goal for universal acceptance program um, at ICANN, as well as uh, the work being done by the community uh, on universal acceptance is that all domain names and email addresses should work in all software applications. Uh, and of course, uh, it has very uh, deep uh, impact uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, having uh, all the domain names and email addresses accepted provides a significant consumer choice to people around the globe. It improves competition in the industry and provides uh, better access to end users, uh, especially those who obviously uh, read and write in a different uh, script and language. So it's an essential sort of prerequisite uh, for all this to work. And here's some possible examples of uh, what's new and what is possible. Uh, so since the uh, new GTLD round uh, for top level domains, in 2012 and also the CCTLD, uh, IDN CCTLD fast track process, which in, was instituted by the ICANN and its community in 2009. As I shared, it is now possible to have many more new top level domains. There are a newer top level domains also in ASCII space. So you can have something like .sky in addition to .com or .org or .net, which are the more traditional ones. And it is also possible to have longer uh, domain names. So the longest we've had earlier was .museum, which was six characters, uh, but now you can actually have, or you, there is uh, 
top level domains uh, which are delegated which are much longer uh, like dot international and dot engineering and dot technology and so on and as we saw earlier that uh, the top level domain can actually be as long as 63 characters so so applications which are for example validating domain names they need to make sure that if you're using for example a regular expression or a regex for short uh, you need to make sure that uh, top level domains uh, are not uh, limited to just uh, 224 or 226 characters, but it, they can actually go much longer. And then the third example shows that you can actually have a domain name uh, in any other script as well. So this is an example of a Thai domain name. Uh, as we'll see, uh, reg regular expressions, of course, will not work very well if you are validating domain names because it will obviously not work well for internationalized domain names. There can be sim similarly internationalized email addresses as well, which we say EAI for short, uh, which stands for email address internationalization. And um, you, you can see that there are all these different kinds of email addresses, including email addresses, which can be totally in a local language, like uh, uh, which contains a Unicode and UTF-8 format at, uh, before that sign and then internationalized domain name after that sign. Um, so if you're uh, working in applications uh, or email tools, you need to make sure that uh, such email addresses are actually also uh, processed appropriately by, by your technology. You know, to go deeper, uh, universal acceptance uh, basically means that all domain names uh, are accepted or can be accepted, validated, processed, stored and displayed. Uh, similarly, all email addresses should also be able to, you know, be accepted, validated, processed, stored, and displayed by all the different applications uh, um, you are developing or you're hosting, you're configuring. So that's sort of the goal. It's uh, easier said than done. So what we've been doing in collaboration with the community-led uh, group, which uh, looks at this problem, it's called Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Uh, or USG for short. Uh, we've actually been looking at uh, how, what are the gaps in universal acceptance at this time. So we've actually, uh, one of the studies which we did was uh, we actually went to uh, about a thousand uh, websites uh, globally. Uh, so we took a, a top 1000 websites from, for example, Alexa rankings. And uh, what we did was we went to the contact us page. And normally at the contact us page, the websites would allow you to submit your email address so that they can get back to you. Uh, so what we did was for each of those uh, 1,000 websites, we submitted one of these different kinds of email addresses. And uh, the new short uh, is like uh, .sky and new long is not, uh, you know, example was dot international in from the previous slide. Even those which are purely ASCII, we see that uh, the recognition of those uh, domain names, uh, sorry, email addresses with those top level domains is not hundred percent. A new short is close to ninety eight percent now, uh, but uh, new long like dot international or dot technology is still around eighty five percent, which means one hundred and fifty websites out of the thousand said that this is an invalid email address, which uh, was not true. But if we eventually go to all Chinese or all Arabic, uh, which are internationalized email addresses, only about 11%, so 110 websites out of a thousand, uh, consider these as valid email addresses and you know close to 900 websites out of a thousand, just uh, reject these uh, email addresses saying that these are uh, invalid email addresses and prompt to obviously ask a valid email address, even though the email addresses we were using were actually valid and working. Uh, so that's a problem to solve. Um, uh, and that's what uh, I guess we'll be talking about today. Uh, we are also looking at email servers in addition to websites. So uh, what we did was we actually went uh, to the zone files, used the zone files of, of about 11, well, 1180 uh, GTLD zones, uh, which have uh, around 210 million uh, domain name registrations uh, and uh, we looked at the MX records to find out the uh, uh, mail servers against these uh, zone files and found about 35 million mail servers uh, 
uh, which were pointed to by about 2.5 million IP addresses. What we did was that we pinged um, these IP addresses with uh, with different kinds of uh, uh, email IDs, including, uh, I guess, uh, internationalized email IDs, and um, saw whether they responded uh, with the, the, the right flag, which we'll see is uh, SMTP UTF-8 flag. Uh, which tells uh, the sending uh, server that uh, the receiving server supports internationalized uh, email addresses. And what we found was that only 7%, so we do this study every quarter, and we find, found that towards the end of uh, last year, uh, about only 7% of the email servers are uh, configured to respond to uh, internationalized email addresses. And so that's a 93% gap in email servers which need to be upgraded to support these kind of email addresses. So of course the problem can lie uh, from an application point of view, lie at uh, any of the layers. Uh, sometimes the standards are uh, not supporting such email addresses, um, sometimes uh, the operating there's gaps in operating system layer sometimes the programming languages are not supporting it and even if everything works at the lower layers sometimes just the applications are developed uh, not keeping these things in mind uh, similarly for um, on the mail side you know for for emails to work all of the uh, mail user agents submission agents transfer agents and delivery agents uh, in the path of the email must be supporting uh, email address internationalization for an email to be uh, successfully sent from a user to a receiver. And if any one of the agents in the path is not able to support internationalized email addresses, of course, the email will be rejected and bounced back. Based on the problem we are solving, um, I'm going to share uh, some of the more fundamental details about domain names and email addresses, um, which, uh, of course, uh, are relevant and uh, what we need to fix. Uh, what I'll do is uh, for this part of the uh, slides, I'll go slightly faster uh, just to make sure that we can cover this in time. Um, but uh, happy to take any questions uh, at the end of the presentation uh, in case uh, there are uh, you know more clarifications which are needed. So uh, some of this we've actually talked about, um, but just to introduce uh, Unicode um, encodes uh, characters across all the different scripts of the world. And uh, it normally uses a U plus XXXX notation in uh, identifying all the different characters. So for example, E in Latin script uh, is uh, encoded as U plus 0065 uh, for ASCII, um, the Unicode codes and the ASCII codes are uh, same or similar. If you can see, ASCII 65 is U, Unicode 0065. Um, and uh, these uh, Unicode uh, data is normally stored in Unicode text files, uh, Unicode based text files, which are normally in uh, UTF 8 format. That's one of the formats. One thing to realize is that not each script is. Uh, encoded in uh, uh, you know single byte or two bytes is actually variable byte format so a character in one script may actually be stored in one byte but a character a single character in another script actually could be stored in two bytes uh, and you can look at uh, utf8 format uh, in more detail to uh, see how to interpret and read those files another thing to note is that uh, unicode can you can represent a single character in multiple ways so E with an accent here can be represented in Unicode directly with 00E8, or it can actually be represented in with two code points, E followed by an accent, which is a combining mark to address the ambiguity because then user can actually type the same string in two ways. Unicode introduces uh, normalization forms uh, which map all the different input possibilities into a single string that has multiple unit normalization forms, but uh, IDNA 2008 uh, uses NFC normalization form C, which would map these two strings onto 00E8. So even if you enter 0065 and plus 0300 and uh, do an NFC conversion, 
with in your programming language it will convert that to 008 other things to note is uh, that the you know we've already talked about how the domain names are formed and what the top level domains but um, uh, the top level domains are not fixed uh, so uh, the root zone database actually lists the current uh, uh, top level domains which are delegated but these actually change over time and similarly um, uh, we've also looked at uh, internationalized domain names which actually can be formed uh, by using a non ascii letter in one of the labels in any one of the labels um, and we've seen that there uh, was an earlier version of which was 2003 but we know, want to make sure that if we are now programming for idns it the the programming must support idna 2008 standard which is the more recent standard idns uh, have two forms so this is an important uh, piece of information to note that we've looked at idns or internationalized domain names in the u label format or the unicode format that's normally intended for human consumption because as humans we read in our own script and language but um, as far as the machines are concerned internally each u label is uh, mapped onto uh, equivalent ASCII label, uh, which is normally referred to as A label, and internally in the systems, everything can actually be processed in the A label format. And then there is there are conversion utilities with, or libraries which are normally available to make U label to A label conversion and back. Uh, this is a lossless conversion, but when you're making it, make sure that you're using a library which is conforming to IDNA 2008 and not the older version idna 2003 when we convert it into ascii format of course uh, it is uh, not possible to uh, distinguish a regular ascii from a uh, u level converted to ascii so what idna 2008 standard has done is to, uh, said that uh, uh, idns uh, will be prefixed by xn dash dash so anything which uh, or hyphen hyphen uh, anything which starts with X and hyphen hyphen is always interpreted as an IDN and not an ASCII string. And therefore also ASCII strings are not allowed to have uh, uh, X and hyphen hyphen uh, before them. Uh, so that uh, separates these two namespaces. Uh, email addresses as well. Uh, we've uh, seen that uh, when we write a mailbox name at domain name, uh, now it is possible to have mailbox name in UTF-8 format and domain name in uh, uh, basically an IDN format. Uh, so it is now possible to have uh, domain names also and email addresses both in uh, local languages and scripts. So when you are developing your own systems, either websites or you're configuring your mail servers, you need to make sure that your uh, website or domain names is properly configured. Uh, we've uh, developed a testing framework, uh, which is a document we call USG026, uh, which provides uh, detailed tests, which you could do at various stages. We encourage you to look at those uh, in case uh, you would like to fix your or update your um, applications to make sure that they are UA ready. Uh, and there are additional test data. So we actually provide email addresses and working email addresses and domain names in all the different languages and scripts, which you can use as test data for testing your applications. Uh, we actually went out and looked at how uh, we can program for UA readiness. And we've actually been looking at all the different programming languages and found that not all libraries which are available to support IDNs or emails are compliant with the UA, uh, meaning that they support uh, internationalized domain names and internationalized email addresses. So we've actually been publishing data. Uh, there, there's a study uh, on programming languages. Uh, the summary is here, uh, which shows which uh, particular libraries you should be using in case you are uh, programming for supporting UA correctly and which lang uh, libraries may actually not work well to support uh, such uh, domain names and email addresses. So when you're programming for websites, for example, and so on, uh, please make sure you're using the correct uh, libraries. Um, and if you're using some other libraries, make sure you can actually program the extra bit to uh, make sure that uh, you do support UA. As far as uh, email address internationalization is concerned, just as a starting point, please do go to usg.tech slash EAI hyphen check. 
to enter your own email address and this will tell you whether the server your email server supports internationalized email addresses it actually gives you a message back uh, it checks your pings your server and checks and tells you uh, whether your server is compliant or not uh, google for example is compliant so if you uh, use your gmail address in here it will say that it works um, but you can check your own email servers through your own email addresses eventually uh, as I was said that uh, both smtp and pop and imap need to be upgraded uh, to address uh, internationalized email addresses smtp especially uses a new flag smtp utf8 uh, which needs to be, I guess, uh, provided during the server and receiver uh, transactions, as we'll see in the next few slides. And uh, so you must be using uh, software or software tools, email tools, which do support uh, EAI for it to work properly. And this is an example of what is happening when actually a sender uh, connects with a a receiver, uh, the two uh, MTAs or mail transfer agents uh, obviously talk to each other. Uh, when the initial uh, signal is uh, e hello is sent by the sender, receiver normally responds with a set of flags. And one of the things to see is that it does respond with an SMTP UTF 8 flag. If it does, then the receiver is configured to receive internationalized email addresses. And you can, for example, send a Chinese email address with an SMTP UTF flag, telling the receiver that here is a, a email address which should be interpreted as an internationalized email address, and all is good. But uh, if any of the servers or any uh, agents in the path does not support uh, internationalized email addresses, the mail would bounce back. Um, we've actually also been looking at the different uh, user agents or different agents, uh, users, submission, transfer, delivery, and agents uh, available. Uh, and uh, we, you know, this provides a summary of uh, what level of EI support they provide. Level one means that they can send and receive, but you cannot generate an email address, new mailbox in local language. Level two supports, of course, uh, says that you can even generate a local language email address in addition to sending and receiving and there are many more details about the study in uh, the document us 3 so um, we've actually um, been developing our own uh, systems or making our own systems you already at a, as well at ICANN. Um, we uh, did this in a three-step process where we were first uh, incrementally updating our systems to support all the different ASCII, long and short top level domains. In the next step, we were supporting IDNs. And in the third step, we are now configuring everything to make sure that EAI or email address internationalization is also uh, workable in all of our systems. And you can read that in the ICANN's case study, which we published. So we have... Um, done a lot of work in collaboration with this work is spearheaded by you uh, universal Assistant steering group which is a community-led volunteer group uh, you can visit usg.tech website to see many of these uh, detailed technical documents which address uh, many of your uh, may address many of your technical concerns there are also training materials available you can also visit icann.org slash ua to look at the detailed training materials available for this purpose. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can email us at either info at usc.tech or uaprogram at icon.org. Uh, more details are available on the websites listed here. And we also have uh, volunteer-based uh, community networks and discussion groups uh, in case you'd like to get more involved. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would hand it back to the organizers to uh, for uh, question and answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Samir. Do we have any questions for the presenter? Take go ahead to the microphone. Hello. I do have one question to ask, which is that. Uh, just because we've been, uh, we started to accept all these like different character domain names and emails, would that create like a a vector for attacks because of phishing? Because a lot of similar characters are going to be accepted, 
and uh, it sounds like this could create a problem for like even currently users are used to checking their ASCII character names. It's like easy to tell like it's zero and an O apart, but it will be harder for Unicode characters. I was wondering if we're prepared for this kind of problems. That's all, thank you. Um, thank you. This is uh, Samar. Thank you for the question. Um, so um, there is uh, ongoing work uh, on uh, looking at phishing. There is uh, actually been some initial studies uh, on whether there is, uh, you know, the level of phishing with the internationalized domain names. Uh, and um, those initial studies at least uh, do not uh, show um, any, any sig you know, significantly more uh, phishing through IDNs. Um, however, uh, also as, uh, as we shared, that uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, top-level domains are concerned, we've actually been working with the community uh, over past many years to make sure that uh, the labels which we define uh, they're done in a way that uh, any uh, at least uh, visual or any other kind of uh, 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 identicalness of labels which uh, may cause confusion for end users, it is actually addressed. So. The root zone label generation rules uh, solution, uh, which has been developed by the different script communities for uh, the root zone, uh, actually looks at it very carefully and uh, makes sure, uh, to the extent possible, of course, um, that uh, any such issues are actually addressed uh, uh, by identifying those uh, or such characters as variant labels. Uh, there is also similar work which is being done for second level and uh, registrations uh, and uh, we continue to work with the community to address, uh, proactively address uh, any potential uh, uh, problems uh, which could occur and uh, we would invite you to look at the work which is being published by ICANN at uh, ICANN.org slash IDN. Uh, to see the rules uh, and uh, solutions which are being developed uh, to address uh, phishing and such uh, security, potential security problems. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> may I? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Sherbovich. Uh, I am uh, from McGill University here in Montreal and uh, I am also the ICAD fellow for the forthcoming meeting in The Hague. I'd like to ask you about the role of national governments. Are they uh, working in collaboration to support the IDM program? Or uh, this is totally uh, wor uh, total work of ICANN and uh, uh, international internet community, because I think uh, national governments, national uh, stakeholders uh, could be interested in internationalization of the domain names and uh, in universal acceptance. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, that's a very good question. So, uh, when we've been when we were developing these uh, solutions, the root zone label generation rule, for example, um, we've uh, it was uh, basically in, uh, done through a very open process where we reached out to the relevant communities, and in many cases, actually in most cases, uh, there were. Uh, the local country code top level domains uh, in many cases also the governments they were actually involved in the process they were part of the panels which we worked with so so they have been engaged we also have a, um, a governmental advisory committee a GAC uh, 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 advisory committee within ICANN uh, where we regularly interact and give them updates and they actually also have a focused uh, working group on internationalized domain names and universal acceptance uh, within GAC, uh, which also uh, just meets and uh, can um, provide advice to ICANN. So uh, we, you know, the work so done so far, uh, we've actually engaged the community, including uh, the public sector. 
uh, and they have actually contributed in many cases. Um, moving forward, in the case of universal acceptance, governments actually are a very key and important stakeholder because uh, uh, when we talk about updating the technology, updating the tools, we are talking about the supply side, right? The technology providers. Uh, but then governments actually come into this whole equation on the demand side, uh, where governments are very large, uh, uh, I guess, consumers or customers of the technology. And if, uh, for example, uh, the governments uh, play a role in uh, asking for support, for example, of uh, domain names and email addresses in the languages which are used by their citizens, that creates the obviously the greater demand which can motivate the technology to uh, you know, support those scripts and languages as well. So we continue to engage with the government. We would like to, of course, uh, uh, work with more, uh, more closely as well uh, to uh, move forward the universal acceptance uh, of uh, domain names and email addresses. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again for your presentation time today, Samad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.